Father, we pray for each person here that we would be edified in our faith, Lord, that we would be built up in Christ during this time together. We love you, Lord. We give you praise again for the opportunity to be together, to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite the kids to come forward. Ms. Kelly, thank you so much. How are you guys this morning? Good? Yeah? You look a little sleepy. You guys must have a busy summer. Have you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so today, Pastor Mark said we're going to hear from Elder Tom, and he's going to be talking about a parable of the persistent widow. And it's a parable that is calls us to pray and pray for God's kingdom to come. So me in our, in our house, we have a, one of our favorite books about prayer and it's called anytime, any place, any prayer. Have you guys ever read this book? Yeah. The Van Z kids probably. No. Okay. Well, good. This will be a new one then. It's one of May's favorite books. So I'm going to read this because I think it's a great, um, book for all of us to, to know, to pray anytime to God. So um, here we go. Many years ago, nearly as long ago as you can go, two people lived with God in a beautiful garden. They were Adam and Eve, and they were friends with God. They could talk with him about every thought they had, every question they wondered, every feeling they felt. They told him anything, anytime. But one day, the devil slithered into the garden as a snake. Adam and Eve decided that the snake's words sounded better than God's words. So they chose not to trust and obey God anymore. This is called sin. And sin spoils beautiful things. Now Adam and Eve were afraid of God. The next time God came to talk to them, they hid. But God found them. He told them that because of their sin, because of their sin, they would have to live outside God's garden, separated from him. Now, people couldn't be with God, but they could still talk with him. Talking with God is called prayer. Nice. But because of sin, prayer is sometimes hard. Sometimes people didn't know what to pray to God. Sometimes they didn't want to pray to him. And sometimes they were just plain old scaredy pants. But God kept reminding his people that he wanted them to talk with him about anything, any time, any place. So they prayed. When they felt that their love or when their love for God so much, they thought their hearts might burst. When they wanted something so badly, it was all they could think about. When they knew they had sinned and needed forgiveness, and when they needed help to do the right thing. Well, we all need help doing the right thing, don't we? God's people prayed many times, millions and billions of times. Oh, can you sit down so your friends can see? Thank you. Until one day, God the Father sent his son, Jesus, to earth. Thank you. Jesus invited people to be his friends. Because he was God, talking with him was like being back in the garden, and it was awesome. And because Jesus was a man, he understood his friends' feelings and their questions about living in a world spoiled by sin. Yes, Jesus was different from other people. He didn't ever sin. He always loved and obeyed his father. Jesus talked with his father any time, any place, any prayer. He told God how he felt when he needed and what he was thinking. And he helped his friends know how to talk to God, too. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Who's heard that prayer before? Probably all of us. Yeah, it's a good one, huh? One day, Jesus told his friends that he had to live or to leave this world. They begged him not to go. Jesus told them not to be afraid. Jesus promised to send God's spirit to come and live in them so they could be closer to God than ever. The spirit would be with them all of the time. Everything. Hey, Granger. (laughs) Everywhere they went. Basically, things would be even more awesome. But first, Jesus had to die on the cross because everyone sins. Everyone deserves to pay the cost of sin, which is to be separated from God forever. Instead, through his death, Jesus paid for our sins so that people could be with God forever. Jesus didn't stay dead. His father raised him back to life. Jesus went back to heaven and sent his spirit to his friends, just as he had planned. Now, there was nothing stopping anyone from being friends together with God. Jesus' friends didn't ever have to be afraid of talking with God about anything, any time, any place. God says... Anyone who loves and trusts Jesus as their friend and king can talk to him. Like this, you can pray about anything. You can tell God every thought you have, every question you wondered, every feeling you feel. You can pray when you feel your love for God so much. You think your heart might burst when you want something so badly. It's all you can think about when you sin and need forgiveness, when you need help to do the right thing. You can pray for a friend who is sick after a dream you had to say thank you for your food, about adventures you want to go on, about what you want to do with your new ninja moves. Most of all, you can pray for God's help to love the things he loves and obey the things he says. And if you're really sad or things are really bad and all you feel like you can do is groan, And say, oh, the spirit will know exactly what you need. And he will pray for you. You can pray anytime, any place. In the car, in the morning, at the playground, in the nighttime, in your bedroom, in your bathroom, by yourself, with your family, with a friend. Someday Jesus will return. His friends will live with God in his perfect and beautiful world forever. We'll talk with God face to face, just like in the garden. Until then, we can talk with God anytime, any place, any prayer. So why not do it right now? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for these kids, and um, we thank you for the youth in our church, Lord, in your church. Thanks for drawing them to yourself. I pray for all of us that we can just continually seek you, seek your kingdom, and know that your promises will be fulfilled um, when your kingdom comes. Lord, help us to pray anytime, any place anywhere in your name. Amen. Thank you so much, Ms. Kelly. At this time, we're going to do things just a little bit different. I'm going to invite you to stand with us. You can stand with us. We're going to we're going to prepare we're going to prepare our hearts for worship at this time. The thing that and I'm not sure and there's something going on with my microphone but that's okay. Um I think that some of you have heard of the Heidelberg Catechism. Um if, if you haven't heard of it, that's okay. Basically, it's a summary of Christian beliefs. And the song that, that Pastor Clay led last week, um, that he introduced to us, the new song, is taken directly from a Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer number one. So what I'm going to do is ask you to read along with me the question and then the answer to Heidelberg Catechism 
question and answer number one. And I want you to think about the words um, to what we're saying here. So think about them as we read them together. Would you read with me? What is thy only comfort in life and in death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who, with his precious blood, has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore by his Holy Spirit he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. If we could go back to the first slide real quickly. This is... The church that I grew up in, we had to memorize these questions and answers. I didn't really appreciate it very much when I was a kid. But I'll tell you, I have really, really come to appreciate this truth, especially over the last 10 years or so. And I'm just thinking about some of the situations that we're going through in our church right now. And I feel like, is there a more powerful truth than for us to think about what is our only comfort in life and death. Because the truth is we're all going to face it, right? We're all going to face it sooner or later. So where do we turn to to find comfort? And the answer is that we belong both body and soul to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because of what he did for us. I realize that I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but isn't it good for us to be reminded of that truth again? This is where we turn to for comfort. We belong to him. He shed his blood for us. And then there's so much truth that we could talk about the rest of that answer we're not going to get into right now. But, but this is the inspiration for this song that we are singing. These are powerful Biblical truths that I want to invite you to think about seriously, even as we sing it this morning. So, without further ado, let's sing together Christ our hope in life and death. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to
to the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, and sin and death will be destroyed. people said, Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know dark won't stop the light from getting through we do and do you wish that you could see it all made new we do is all creation groaning unworthy.
Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you so much for singing with us. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Am I, am I on? He is worthy, amen? Amen. So I, I, I love that song. There we go. Thank you. If you'd open up your Bibles in, uh, to uh, Luke 18, we're going to be uh, teaching and preaching from the parable uh, we find there. Um, if you were here last week, you probably had the uh, uncomforting uh, experience of getting your ears blown out by the sound man, and that was me. So we thought, well, maybe this week I ought to preach instead. So we'll see how this goes. Page uh, 877 in your pew Bibles, we're going to just read the first eight verses, Matthew 18, I'm sorry, Luke 18. If I told you Matthew, I was wrong. Luke 18, um, we're off to a great start here, aren't we? Luke 18, 1, 1 through 8. 
God's word says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to pray, ought to always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because the widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, will the Son of Man come? When he, will he find faith on earth? Let's pray. Father, it is a privilege and a blessing that I can be here, that uh, I can just proclaim your word as you've shown it to me over the, the days and weeks leading up to this, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would just fill us today with your spiritual wisdom, your understanding, uh, that we would be strengthened by the power of your spirit in, in everything that's, that's uh, said and done. Father, we just pray that our walk will be fruitful and uh, that what we do is pleasing to you. Um, so I, I pray, Lord, that you would lay me, lay, lay me aside, that you would be shown through that what is proclaimed and uh, everything would be clearly understood, Father, and that you would get the glory for it all, Lord. And, and Lord, I would like to lift up some folks in prayer, Father. Um, we do lift up Annie Van Dyken. Uh, we lift up Kendall and Jackson, Otis, Rick and Elaine. Heidi, Jason, and Kyle, Lord, as uh, Andy is, is, we just thank you so much that he's home now. Lord, I ask for wisdom as the family is, is making decisions on what the next uh, steps will be. Would you give them guidance and wisdom? Uh, would you comfort them in, in this whole situation, Father? I uh, lift up Mike and Renee Banks. Uh, we're just thankful for that, the great uh, mess uh, message that they receive that her cancer is in a better situation. Lord, we just continue to lift them up, you know, give them comfort, continued healing. Uh, Lord, I pray for Mike Santee, Lord. I, I visited with him this morning. He's got a big day coming up on Friday. Uh, some major decisions and some trials that he's going through. Would you just uh, be with him? Would you guide him? Would you give him wisdom? Would you give those that are uh, making decisions on his situation, would you give them uh, wisdom and discernment in, in doing what's just and what's right. Uh, Father, we again lift up Dave Shear to you as he is uh, still battling, battling with his cancer. Uh, we just uh, ask your blessings, comfort, and healing be upon him. Uh, you be with Mary as she struggles right alongside of him to deal with that difficult situation. Father, would you just have your hand on their, their, uh, their, whole, their whole situation there. And uh, Father, again, lift up Don Lewis to you. Just, just a blessing to see him here again this morning. Um, Lord, it sounds like he's got a heart procedure coming up with some stents uh, this Tuesday and next Tuesday. Would you just, uh, would you just comfort him? Would you give the doctors uh, wisdom and and a and a free, uh, free, just your Holy Spirit to just guide them through that process? Would you comfort Charlotte and the family as as they just help him? Uh, just cope with this whole situation, and would you just give them wisdom as well? Father, would you just be with uh, me today as I speak? Would you just uh, speak through me? Would you be at, get the honor and the glory? Because, Lord, we do this in the name of your Son. We pray in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, well, i got to start out with a drink of water here. So, so in order to, uh, we're looking at, whoops. You're making me feel better now. <laughs> so we're look, going to be looking at the, pat, the uh, parable in Luke 18, but we need to look at the context in order to understand what, what that is. So in, in chapter 17, what we see is we see the context that's leading up to the parable in Luke 18, that the Pharisees are asking Jesus, when is the kingdom, when is it going to appear? 
And Jesus aptly replies that uh, it's essentially here. In other words, Jesus is right there in front of them. The, the, the kingdom of God is, is, is there in front of them, walking amongst them, but they don't understand this. And then he tells the disciples that there's going to be a day that comes when you're going to be looking around and you're not going to see me. You're going to, I'm, going to be, I'm not going to be amongst you. and You'll not find me. But he also warns them. We're working on it here. And, and he reminds them, he reminds the disciples that when I'm not here, be, be aware there's going to be many false messiahs that are going to be coming. And, but there's going to be a time when no one expects, when I will return, I am going to come back. And he paints a picture of a lightning strike that, that goes across the sky that everybody will see um, and no one's going to miss and it's going to light up everything. And that's a picture of his coming back. Um, Jesus doesn't tell them exactly when or how that's going to happen. Um, but he does say that he's going to have to suffer many things first. And then he adds to the disciples, he says, that whoever's going to lose his life will have to, whoever's going to, I'm sorry, whoever's going to keep his life will have to lose it. And whoever loses his life will have to preserve it. So Jesus is implying that there's going to be troubled times ahead. He says, I'm going, to be suffer, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to be rejected, and you guys, you disciples are going to feel the effects. And for his disciples, who only, if you remember a few chapters earlier, were arguing amongst themselves, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? This must have been a very confusing message to them. So Jesus uses a parable to help them understand how to remain hopeful and how to know what their hope is based on. Now, we really don't have to guess what the meaning of this parable is because Luke tells us in the very first verse exactly what the meaning of the parable is. Now, maybe some of us have read this parable in the past and, and we've taken away from it that if we just pester God enough, if we just keep hounding on him and pounding on him, he's going to answer our prayers. Um, that's the way it's been preached before. That's the way I've kind of read that parable before. But when we get a look at the context, it's really spelled out here in verse 1, and then we'll look at the parable to see how that fits in. So, again, we don't have to guess at the meaning. If we look at verse 1, and it says, and he, and this is Luke talking, and he, Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they, always, that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So, essentially, there we have, in a nutshell, this is what this parable is, is trying to bring out. This is what Jesus is trying to to make by this parable. Now, we don't know if Jesus actually told the disciples that this is what it's about. All we can tell from Scripture is that he told the disciples what the parable was about. Luke is helping us understand this. So the message is, it's necessary to pray and not grow weary or give up. The word ought, that you always ought to pray, means you need to pray. He says it because he knew Keeping the disciples focused on his return is what would sustain them. And praying is what would keep them focused. By this parable, Jesus is helping his disciples to understand how not to lose heart, but to stay encouraged when discouragement and hardship will be pressing down on all sides. So he's essentially saying, pray, and pray specifically for my return. Your hope is grounded in my return. And in the immediate context that we see, Jesus is teaching, be praying for my return, for that's what is going to keep you hopeful. Now, there's a broader application that we can take from this teaching as well. We see that the verse also says that we always ought to pray. Why is this the situation? Because persistence cultivates patience. To be persistent in anything requires a certain amount of patience. If you've ever trained a dog or if you maybe trained a horse or, like most of us, at least tried to train our kids, we know that we have to be persistent and we have to be patient. James 5, 7, and 8 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, 
There we see that word again. Meaning strengthen. Make your heart firm. He goes on to say, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. If you are not willing to wait upon the Lord, you won't likely persist. One commentator says, Patient reveals, patience reveals our faith in God's timing, omnipotence, and love. But there's also something else to be seen in this first verse. Mm-hmm. Scripture, can you hear me? Scripture seems to be drawing a close connection between the relationship of prayer and an encouraged heart. We pray so we don't give up. We pray so we don't lose heart, but we also pray so we don't sin, which is another source of discouragement. Sin is a cause of discouragement, but prayer is the preventative measure. It's like taking vitamins to prevent a sickness rather than having to take a prescription to cure it. So often we find ourselves reaping the fallout from the problems that could have been prevented by first bathing the issue in preventative preemptive prayer. For example, and we heard it today, Kelly was reciting in the Lord's Prayer, we we read, lead me not into temptation. That's a prayer of prevention, as opposed to, Lord, forgive me for giving in to temptation, a reactive prayer of repentance. Or we might pray, Lord, help me love my wife as Christ loves the church. That's being preemptive in prayer as opposed to forgive me, Lord, for not loving my wife as I should after the damage of some transgression has been done. So there's many benefits to prayer, but what we see here in this first verse is that a consistent and assertive prayer life is going to sustain hope and encouragement. To a Christian, prayer should become as natural as breathing. To pray without ceasing is to be constantly regarding God's grace in our lives. It's difficult to become discouraged when one's heart is focused on God's grace. But what's the source of this hope? This is where we get into the parable. In this parable, which is a parable of contrast, unlike some of the other parables we see where we might say the heaven, the kingdom of God is like such and such, this is a parable of what Um, theologians call a parable of contrast. In this parable, Jesus introduces us to a judge and this pesky widow who won't relent until she gets justice. Verse 6 says, and you can look at your Bibles if you want, and the Lord said, so Jesus is saying, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Jesus is bringing our attention right back to the judge's own words which are, in verse 4, the judge, this unrighteous judge says, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because the widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So the reputation of this judge within the society of his jurisdiction was not only one of being harsh, unjust, and very possibly corrupt, but he readily admits his own disregard for God and disdain for people. So he was not only a bad judge, but he was a bad person as well. This judge was the antithesis of what God expects in a man. We read in Micah 6, 8, a verse you're probably familiar with, where God says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. But this judge was bad, and he admits it with no apparent conviction to even try to justify himself. Now, in my lifetime, and I've been around a few few decades, and probably some of you can remember this as well, that there's been a lot of uh, presidents, will you say, and uh, leaders that maybe have had less than uh, perfect and shiny reputations. Um, and many, many of them have major character flaws, but I can't ever think of one that ever admitted to it. In this judge's pompous pride, he admits that he has no fear of God. And the Greek word used here for fear means fear, not just a reverent respect of God, which is a believer's kind of fear, 
but the kind of fear that anyone who dis disregards Christ will one day face. The kind of fear Isaiah wrote about when he exclaimed, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear, and he is the one you are to dread. This judge also admits he has no respect for people. This proves true as we see that his real motive for finally granting the widow justice was only for the purpose of getting some personal relief. It had nothing to do with her need for justice, and there was no mercy involved. Mercy has to do with kindness and compassion. James 2.13 tells us, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. So there will be certainly no mercy for this judge when ultimate justice comes and is finally meted out to him. Then in this parable, we see this vulnerable widow. The Jewish community, community was commissioned to seek the care of widows, orphans, and the oppressed. In Exodus, we read, you shall not mistreat any widows or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And it was for the neglect of widows in the book of Acts that we see the appearance of the first deacons in the church. For some unstated reason, this widow was being treated with indifference and being refused the justice she deserved. She had no lawyer to plead her case, and it's possible that Jesus had in mind the widows that we find described later in Luke as being the victims of what I would call a New Testament version of a modern-day scam where unscrupulous scribes devoured widows' houses, shamelessly cheating them out of their property. So the hope we find is given in, is, the hope we are given is found in the contrast that Jesus is drawing out of this parable. And there are many, but we're going to just quickly look at a few of the more obvious ones. <clears throat> First, this widow, she had no husband, and she was entirely on her own, a total stranger to this unrighteous judge, and she was in desperate need of justice. But Christians, we are called the bride of Christ. We're waiting and looking to be reunited, reunited with Jesus. Christians have a judge who is caring and righteous and holy and true. We are not a stranger, but we are called by name, adopted and loved by the Father. The widow had no one to advocate her case. She had no lawyer. She had no, no one to plead her, her cause before this judge. You and I, brothers and sisters, we have the Holy Spirit interceding in our prayers. We have Jesus Christ pleading our cause, and we stand righteous before God because of the punishment Christ endured on our behalf. We have Jesus Christ himself, the one by whom all things were created, to plead our case for us. And also we see a widow who was confined to a court of law, but we as Christians, we have, are given open access to the throne of God's grace anytime and anywhere. Jesus is explaining through this parable that if a defenseless widow can draw the basic justice out of an unrighteous judge through simple persistence, how much more will our holy and righteous father be willing to answer the persistent prayers of his children? He's telling us, stand strong, keep praying, and don't lose heart. Justice is coming. And within this wide contrast between an unrighteous, just, unrighteous judge and a holy and perfectly righteous God, it's within that contrast that we can anchor our hope and confidence in God's promises that as we patiently wait for his return. You might look at Luke 18.8, <clears throat> which the next, next and the last verse in this, in this parable. And it says, I tell you, and this is Jesus talking, he will give justice to them speedily. You might be objecting but see, it says God will be speedy in his justice. I just don't see God responding to my prayers at all. Maybe you're being surrounded by the ravages of sickness or horrified by the senseless murders that are becoming all too common. Or you find yourself praying to a, uh, for a country that seems to be rocketing away from the common Christian roots that helped make it so great. You feel so little response to your prayers but the word speedily 
The Greek word speedily can also mean or carry the meaning of suddenly. Now, I believe this is the context here. As we think back to chapter 17, where Jesus is talking about coming as a lightning bolt streaking across the sky, that he's going to come suddenly. And when he does, there will be a lot of injustices that we think have been ignored that will be swiftly made right. Yet there's a lot of mystery in how prayer works, and we can't understand that we, and a lot we can't understand, but God's not blind to our frustration and injustices. And Scripture says that he hears the prayers of his people. Most of us probably understand that in some sense, God answers our prayers with either a yes, no, or a not now. Sometimes God answers no because we ask with the wrong motives. <clears throat> James 4.3 tells us, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. You ask amiss. You ask with the wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. In this country, we're really good at doing that, aren't we? Spending our, our, all, all the things, time, effort, money on our pleasures. And sometimes the answer is no because we ask for things, even good things, that may not be in line with God's will. 1 John 5.14 tells us, and this is the confidence that we can have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And God sometimes answers not now because he has to adjust our motives to bend our will to his reshaping our heart over the anvil of time. And there is also an aspect of need. Commentator Steve Cole says, Sometimes the Lord delays to answer us because we do not see how needy we really are until he keeps us waiting for a while. What motivated this widow to persist? She was driven to persist because she had a great need, and not getting what she needed was not an option. I was involved in a recent experience where I'm convinced persistence Having a great need and God's perfect timing converged to bring a most unlikely unbeliever to faith in Christ. I met Calvin, who's well, using a, a pseudonym, a few weeks ago while working with TJ, TJ Line in the local jail ministry, which I've been privileged to help him out occasionally. Calvin opened up about some of his past. He said that about a year ago, in the thick of the pandemic, he was incarcerated in a Texas jail. Because the pandemic lockdown was so strict, inmates were forbidden to interact in any way. They couldn't even be in the same room together. They were for forbidden to even talk to each other. And worst of all, for the fear of spreading COVID, they were denied access to any reading materials, which is the lifeline of many inmates. Calvin spent 24 hours each day with literally nothing to do but to stare at concrete walls, steel bars, and to think. The only exception each day, once a day, he was allowed a scheduled 30-minute exercise break by himself outside of his cell. It became beyond tolerable for Calvin, and he was desperate for something to do. It occurred to him that one thing that couldn't be denied was an access to a Bible. He admitted to us that upon to that up upon up that up to that point, he had never read the Bible, and he had had no use for it, giving me the impression that he thought it was a total waste of paper, but at least a Bible would provide him something to read. So he made the request to the appropriate prison guard and was met with total apathy. Like the unrighteous judge, the prison guard didn't care. Knowing Calvin's reputation, he assumed, and probably rightfully so, that it was just a ploy. Repeated requests continued to be ignored, but knowing his constitutional rights, Calvin threatened the prison authorities with legal action. And like the widow and us concerning prayer, Calvin persisted because he had a great need, and no wasn't an option for him. But it wasn't until about 8.30 <clears throat> one morning when he saw the chaplain wheel in a cart into the common area just in front of his cell, that he realized his good fortune. <clears throat> On top of that cart were spewed about, spewed about some religious materials, and there in the middle of it was a Bible. The problem now was that Calvin's 30 minutes of free time 
when he could claim his Bible wasn't scheduled till 11.30 that evening. Calvin had to spend an excruciating 15 hours just staring at that Bible, just out of arm's reach. I don't think that was set up by accident. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. I believe God was using those 15 hours to build up in Calvin an unquenchable need to read this Bible. And my guess is after those long 15 hours, when it was finally in his hands, that he began to devour it, and God had used those 15 hours to make him extremely hungry for it. And that launched the beginning of a spiritual transformation in Calvin. Then we come to the last part of verse 8 that says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is an oddly connected verse that some commentators say Luke must have inserted it for reasons which I personally wasn't able to fully grasp. Will he find faith? Some say the answer is probably no. Many commentators simply don't know what the true meaning is to this text is. But the first thing to notice is that Jesus again mentions he's going to be returning. This is a promise. This ties in perfectly with the context of chapter 17. He again is saying, this is my promise, and this is your hope. I am coming back. It seems that when you consider the context of the entire parable, it might be that Jesus is asking, will you be obedient? Will you pray so as to not lose heart? Because I told you I'm coming back. I've shown you what a faithful and righteous judge you serve. If you will be obedient to do these things, and yes, I undoubtedly will find faith in those that do these things when I return. Jesus is reminding us, don't be discouraged. Keep praying because I am coming back. And when I do, my justice will be swift, fair, and eternal. And that, take heart. Before TJ and I left Calvin at the end of our Bible study, he had something else to say. He added something that I'll paraphrase, saying, there was a time in my life when I thought I had everything. I had fancy cars. I had lots of drugs and women. I had a $500,000 house paid for in cash, and I physically handed millions of dollars. But I was an unhappy man with no hope. <clears throat> and God had to take everything away. <clears throat> Then he continued, now I physically have nothing. I weighed out my day while trying to deal with a frustrating judicial system, kind of like the, the widow. But I am today a satisfied and content follower of Christ. I still have that Bible, he admitted, and now my hope is knowing that I serve the King of Kings. Now, Calvin's still got a lot of problems he's dealing with, but he knows who he is serves. We don't have to be a rocket scientist to, really, to realize that something is terribly broken in this world. <clears throat> we live in times where unrighteousness and evil are considered normal, where sin is marginalized and where the world's injustices seem to be infringing on the freedoms of Christians more every day. There's a lot of faces there, or at least a number that I don't recognize today. So if you are a visitor today, or maybe you're watching online, maybe it's your curiosity that's brought you here. Maybe you're just like, maybe you're just trying to make sense of all the evil and unjust, injustice in the world. Maybe like the disciples, you too are somewhat troubled and confused by what's happening around you. Here's the answer. Scripture says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me, talking about Jesus. To believe means more than to simply think something is true that you can't see, like believing that Washington crossed the Delaware or believing that in Paul Revere's famous ride. To believe in Jesus is to place a total reliance on him, even if imperfectly. It is placing a growing reliance upon every decision you make, and every frustration or hurt you experience, Jesus will intercede on your behalf. And when you trust by God's grace in his time, that he will do just that. Without Christ, you are like the helpless widow, destitute spiritually, with no one to advocate on your, on your behalf. 
And what benefits you do reap for yourself on earth will have no eternal value. Psalms 127.1 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it, build it in vain. Without Christ, justice for sin is a literal hell of torment or you'll be separated from your Creator and anything good forever. Hebrew 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Why? Because God is going to have the last say. And his decisions will be based on what you did with Jesus, given all the opportunities you were given in this life that will soon be gone like a vapor in the wind. Maybe you wonder if this God we profess could really exist. I was hoping that the windows would curtains be open today. I don't normally encourage people to look outside, and maybe there's reasons not, but if we were to look outside, what would we see? We would see, obviously, we have a privilege and the blessing of, in, at Trail here to see the lake and the mountains and the beautiful sky and the, and the wildlife. Did you see the moon the last few nights? Man, what, a, what an incredible blessing. Did you see the pictures taken from outer space? this last week from this new telephone telescope that were revealed. They're absolutely stunning. Psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. We see the unquestionable beauty, complexity, and creativity that only could happen by an intelligent designer. But like the Pharisees looking for the kingdom of God when it was right in front of them, the natural world keeps probing deeper into space looking for answers to our existence. When we have the answers right in front of our eyes, in the beauty of his creative handiwork, and in the power of his word. We see God's creativity everywhere. Even in this room, look around. This is a room filled with people whose hearts have been forever changed through the miracle of God's grace. Not perfect people, definitely not people devoid of trials and struggles and pains, but changed people with an unwavering hope, knowing that by the blood of Christ their sins have been paid for and that eternity, be, eternity will be spent in the presence of their Creator with everything made right again the way God originally intended. Folks, the works of the cross changes lives, and we see that clearly in John 1, and you can see it again in Corinthians 3.16, that this Jesus that had a creating role in everything good, everything that we can see and everything that we can't see that's good, it's the same Jesus that hung on the cross. Sometimes we don't, we disconnect that. Sometimes we forget about that. This is the same Jesus that was both fully God and fully sinless man that died the death that you and I deserved was buried and was resurrected back to life, creating a way back into our right relationship with the Father, a relationship we were always meant to be in. But sin destroyed all that. Romans 3.23 warns the wages of sin is death, physical death and spiritual death. You and I aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And no thanks to our first parents, Adam and Eve, it's it's in our DNA, and some say that's literally. We were born with a death, death sentence over our head, and we by ourselves can't change that no matter how hard we might try. In Jeremiah 13.23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? The answer is emphatically no implying that it is impossible for man to change his sinful condition. But the good news is that God can. Romans 3.23 goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, eternal life is more than just existing for infinity. Let me read you the Bible's definition of eternal life. John 17.3, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who you, whom you have sent. Eternal life is a continual growing in the knowledge of the only true God and his son, Jesus Christ. 
Eternal life is experiencing that deep and rich relationship with God, a process that will never be exhausted, an existence we will enjoy forever and ever. The good news of the gospel is, is, is if you repent and you put your faith in Christ, God will grant you a new spiritual heart, one that de desires to do an about face with sin and wants to live for him in a relationship that will never fade. If you are here and you've never done that, or if you're watching online and you never put your trust in Christ, I invite you to do that today. Don't leave without doing that. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible tells us. You may not have another chance. Church, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. We serve a righteous judge. Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may pro proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the application of this parable is short and it's simple. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. For Jesus will one day return to establish his kingdom and all things will once again be restored to perfection. Let's pray. Father, it's a... It is a blessing to be in your word. It is a blessing to know that your promises are true. It's a blessing to know that we serve a great God and a righteous judge. It's a blessing to know, Lord, that our prayers will keep us hopeful until you do return. Father, we just thank you for this truth. We thank you for the blessing of, of living in this beautiful part of the country where we can see your creation so clearly. Lord, your word tells us that man is without excuse. And Lord, we just pray today that we would remember that you are a good and righteous father and you wish good things upon your children. We pray for the obedience, Lord, that we should have. Lord, that we should uh, desire to uh, just just do on a daily basis to be in your word, to, to be in prayer, and to have a desire to be more Christ-like every day. Father, would you just bless this time, bless the week ahead for these people. Lord, give them uh, an opportunity to think about the things that were proclaimed through your word. And Lord, as I mentioned, if there's anybody here today that has never trusted you as Lord and Savior, Lord, would today be that day of salvation, Lord. I pray these things because we... Trust in your son's name, Lord. It's in the power of his name that we can just have hope, that we can pray these things, and we do pray in his name. Amen. Thank you. And at this time. Thank you so much, Brother Tom, for serving us with the word of the Lord today. Just a, just a quick announcement before we sing a song together. I think, and you can stand, please, please stand. You can stand with us even right now. Thank you. So I think that probably many of you are aware of that Pastor Clay and his wife, Mackenzie, have been fostering a little baby girl for the past two months or so, right around, right around two months. I'm looking at Mackenzie, but... Uh, so somewhere around there, Clay could explain this better to you, but there, her case is coming up possibly this week, which, which has to do with her future and whether or not she gets to spend more time with Pastor Clay and Mackenzie, those kinds of questions. Is that a good way to put it? Relatively, relatively close. Pastor Clay has asked for, if, if there's anybody here that would like to pray with them after the service in regards to Kaylee, in regards to her future, you can meet us up front here. Um, there's just going to be an open time of prayer just in regards to all of that. So that's going to be immediately following the service. You can meet over here just in front of the piano, okay? 
At this time, we're going to sing our last song with you. What a friend we have in Jesus. Would you receive the benediction now? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Thanks so much for meeting here today. May God bless you as you go.